Welcome to the New Republic's podcast by Outlet Opinion. Red Dusk by Martin Peretz. The Rosenberg Bombshell. As both doctrine and praxis, to borrow from the old vernacular, communism may have been the most vicious phenomenon of the 20th century. Part of the viciousness was its canny competence in purporting to be the chalice of hope for mankind. Nazism was also cruel, very cruel, and industrially proficient in the mechanics of mass death. But it had no pretensions to universal humanitarianism. It was a master race ideology. Given this undisguised basic principle, its enemies and victims were evident at the near start, and they were, by definition, counted in the multitudes. Perhaps that is one reason why Hitler's demented regime lasted a bare dozen years. But the world is not quite done with the epigons of Leninism, some still governing in a few benighted, if enormous, jurisdictions, and others still fighting, poor deluded folk, in the mountains. How much longer can a lie like this last? In all, communism has slaughtered well over 100 million and still counting. How many souls its rule also ruined is harder to know. A new book, The Forsaken, by Tim Zuliatis, the existence of which I first noticed in a review by the myth-breaking American historian Ronald Radash in National Review, unveils a wholly new topic, the deadly fate of the thousands of American communists and sympathizers who went to the Soviet Union to build socialism. For many, this was another form of aliyah, except not to the Jewish homeland that turned out to be a success, but to the fatherland of labor that ended in political, ideological, economic, demographic, and ethical ruin, not to mention the gulag. In America, and in other Western societies, however, there still remain coteries of intellectuals and other high-minded people who have trouble absorbing the simplest historic truths, truths which ordinary workers in highly ideological labor England say have had absolutely no difficulties absorbing, even more so among unionized workers in the United States. The blindness of these metaminds does not quite absolve Stalin of his crimes, but it willfully looks away from those of Castro or Che, who still hold a special place in the hearts of people calling themselves progressives. The West never quite focused on the enormities of the Mao regime, so to many of these revolutionaries, the worst atrocity of 20th century China was the Japanese rape of Nanking. Mao is merely a cultural icon created by Andy Warhol and sanitized by the chairman's presence over fireplaces in the houses of many magnates. Zuliatis and Radash etch the indifference of the bien pensant scrupulously. In any case, they no longer deny Stalin's crimes. They compare them to the crimes of others favorably. The exemplary master of this distorted moral relativism is George Steiner, thought of otherwise, if anyone still thinks of him at all, as a prophet of moral absolutism. You know the type, a person who cannot tolerate an Israeli lifting a gun, but for his own sentimental purposes, Steiner does make comparisons. Quote, to infer, he writes in criticism of Solzhenitsyn's The Gulag Archipelago, that the Soviet terror is as hideous as Hitlerism, is not only a brutal simplification, but a moral indecency, end quote. Last week, a bunker buster hit the carefully preserved world of the post-fellow traveling fellow traveler. No longer advertising the kindnesses of Stalin, as Lillian Hellman used to do, the strange but numerous social type had clung to the innocence and idealism of Stalin's sympathizers. They still think Alger Hiss innocent, Dalton Trumbo honest, Hellman, a heroine, Ilya Kazan, a rat. In this world, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were sent to their deaths pure as the driven snow, their only sin being belief in, well, in what did they actually believe? In Marx, in Lenin, in Stalin, in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, devout, deluded, and disloyal to the country in which they lived. There is a whole culture in America that has believed the innocence of the Rosenbergs as doctrine and dogma. The texts of this culture are not scrupulous histories, because such histories would undermine its beliefs. They are, instead, one novel and one play, fiction being more amenable to false history, both these cases being tales of the Rosenberg's innocence. The narrative is E.L. Doctorow's The Book of Daniel, a best-selling book of the 1970s. The drama is Tony Kushner's phantasmagoric Angels in America, which won the Pulitzer Prize and features Ethel haunting the last days of Roy Cohn, who had been on the legal team prosecuting the Rosenbergs, and boasted in his autobiography of convincing the judge to sentence them to death, an ugly boast about an ugly deed by an ugly man. The position of these literary works tells you something about the culture in which they still shine. So what is the Bunker Buster? 
It is Sam Roberts' September 11th New York Times interview with Morton Sobel, a co-defendant of the Rosenbergs, who had also been found guilty and served more than 18 years in Alcatraz. In the nearly six decades since the beginning of the case, Sobel had maintained his innocence. Suddenly, he admits the great lie of his life. He is guilty, he concedes, and so was Julius. There are still doubts about what exactly Ethel did or did not do. Richard Nixon apparently told a confidant in 1983 that this was, in fact, the case, and that had President Eisenhower known about the vagaries in her situation, he would have commuted the sentence on the grounds of tainted evidence. But the evidence of a widely netted Soviet atomic spy ring with Julius at its apex is incontrovertible. So incontrovertible that now even Julius's long crusading sons concede the ugly truth about their father. I wonder what the folks around the nation were feeling when their underlying sense of post-war America essentially collapsed last week, and what Victor Novosky, its pater familias, is feeling too. He has been the cheerleader of the Everybody Was Innocent school in American sentimental thought about communism and its fellow.